The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill, and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, magic, and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author, and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome. My name is Charles Christian and you're listening to the latest episode of the Weird Tales radio show podcast. This is episode 46 and uh, just in time for Christmas, so you won't be surprised to hear we've got quite a few Christmassy themed uh, paranormal folklore stories for you. But let's get on with the show. And we start with a roundup of uh, recent folklore and paranormal news. Okay, Christmas. Yes, it's that time of the year. Have you ever wondered why Christmas crackers have crown shaped paper hats in them? Hmm? Uh, it prompted me to think this. Uh, there's a company I deal with who uh, send out at the beginning of the Christmas season a crown shaped Christmas card and. Uh, invite people to send in selfies of themselves wearing the hat in uh, interesting positions. Well, it actually is a hangover from the medieval periods when we used to have, during the 12 days of Christmas, it was tradition to have Lords of Misrule. These would be somebody in the household, we're obviously talking here about the nobility, uh, who would organise the festivities and ensure everybody had a fun time and it would involve games and risks and uh, doing crazy things. Uh, they even did it in monasteries where they had an abbot of misrule and in some instances they would appoint a choir boy as the child bishop to uh, organise things and you, you hear a monks organising snowball fights in the middle of religious ceremonies. However, it's not just the medieval period, it goes back even earlier to the time of the ancient Romans when they used to have a festival called Saturnalia which ran from uh, just before, uh, from about now through till just after what we now call Christmas Day, 25th of December. And again, there was a tradition that you would appoint a king who wore a crown and this king would be the person who'd organised the revels for that time. I say, sadly, the Puritan Reformation and particularly the uh, time during the English Civil War uh, squashed all that kind of outrageous fun and things became a lot more dull over Christmas and then the Victorians got in there and it all became rather staid. However, along with the paper hats, there is still one remaining trait and that is mistletoe. Yes, mistletoe. Um, the connection is during the Saturnalia and the period of the Lords of Misrule, one of the features was the reversal of roles. So in ancient Rome, the masters would serve their servants and slaves, and the slaves would be nominally the leader of the household. Obviously, not too outrageously so, because they'd probably get slaughtered when the period ended. However, as part of this uh, Things were acceptable over Saturnalia and during the 12 days of Christmas that weren't acceptable during the rest of the year. We still have the tradition of kissing people under the mistletoe. In the normal courses of events, kissing complete strangers is completely unacceptable, particularly in these Me Too days. However, mistletoe and Christmas is one of those exceptions where you are allowed to do it. So there maybe 2,000 year old tradition that went out with the Romans but we still have little relics of it hanging on with mistletoe and paper crowns. Okay, change of topic, weather law. Um, we have a 
old Norfolk boy who uh, helps us here at uh, the studios, organising our garden, clearing stuff away and generally doing uh, the kind of jobs that I hate doing. And uh, I was talking to him earlier in the month and there was a waxing moon. That's a uh, new moon that's just starting to thicken up. And he pointed out to it that the moon was more or less vertical in the sky so that the two horns, that's the pointy bit of the crescent moon, the two horns were almost above each other. And he said that's called a wet moon and indicates that rain is to come. Uh, This is opposed to the more sloping type of crescent moon where it's almost on its back, the two points, and The legend is the concave curve between the two horns could catch and hold rainwater. So when you see a moon like that, that's a dry moon. When you see the more vertical one, that's a wet moon. And it was right. We had rain. One final story now. Now, um, one of the things that always intrigues us here on Weird Tales are the number of stories of uh, ghostly sightings of not just headless people, but people being pulled in carriages by headless horses. I can understand people who have had their heads cut off, obviously, not having their head with them, but why the headless horses? Well, uh, thanks to our friends at Ancient Origins, they've uh, dug up a story, literally dug up, about an archaeological dig in Pocklington in Yorkshire. And there they found a complete chariot, we're talking the Celtic era, pre-Roman era, a complete chariot with its owner, a man, still inside it. And uh, they are quite convinced it was a man of high profile, be it a warrior because he had his shield with him. And they were also a large number of sacrificed pigs surrounding him. So he was obviously a major member of his community. However, the more interesting part is that attached to the chariot were two horses and they had been posed in such a position that it would appear that they were springing from the grave. They are... uh, Back legs were bent over and their front legs were raised as if they were galloping and rearing out of the ground. And uh, the thought is that when the grave was first done, part of the horses would still be above ground and visible to everyone to uh, indicate that uh, here was a great warrior on his world galloping into the afterlife and the realm of the dead. But there were no heads on the horses and the suggestion is uh, that over time, because they were exposed, the horses' heads would have rotted off and fallen to the ground and been lost. So perhaps this is where the legend of headless horses comes from, pulling carriages. That if it's fair to assume this was not a one-off type of Um, inhumation that other burials would have adopted the same thing so perhaps in those days uh, it was quite common for leading warriors and their tribes to be buried with their horses and in due course the horses heads would fall off and um, there would be in the moonlight you'd see the ghostly skeletal remains of headless horses Mm, makes you wonder And here's Janie, who's going to talk to us about some Christmas foods that we may not normally associate with being edible. (laughs) Yes, Christmas. Well, you know, back in the day, they wouldn't have had Iceland and Sainsbury's and Waitrose. So they came up with Frommity. Frommity? Frommity, yes. It was actually extremely popular. Um, And it's possibly our oldest national dish. Oh, really? Exactly. So, what's it made of? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, it was a staple dish, but it was used for festive occasions. And um, the name frumentum actually means corn. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Well, the basic ingredient was wheat boiled mm. in milk. So you're kind of thinking porridgey, but mm-hmm. no. Um, it it it, uh, it could be made very rich, very tasty, depending you know what you put in it. And just to kind of set the scene, here's some methods of preparing it. All right, a typical method was to parboil, that's, you know, slightly boil, whole grains of wheat in water, then strain it off, then boil it in milk, then sweeten it with sugar, and then a bit of flavour uh, with cinnamon and spices. So you've kind of got a bit of a porridge thing going on. Um, 300 years ago, there's a receipt that says... Take clean wheat and bray it in a mortar until the hulls be all gone off and seethe it till it burst and take it up and let it cool. And take clean fresh broth and sweet milk of almonds or sweet milk of kine, not sure what that is, and temper it and take yolks of eggs. Boil it a little, wet it down and mess it forth with fat venison or fresh mutton. So you could make it savoury. Mm-hmm. Savoury porridge with mutton. Yes. Gosh, drooling already. And <gasps> can't help think if you were gluten intolerant, lactose intolerant and a vegetarian, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be very hungry. <laughs> yes, I don't think there's a corn version of this. <laughs> um, in Somerset and Wiltshire, lovely UK counties, uh, about 40 years ago, apparently, country women in shawls and sunbonnets would come to the market in Western Supermare in little carts carrying basins of new wheat boiled to a jelly. That was then put in a large pot of milk with eggs and sultanas, lightly cooked, and the resulting mixture was poured into pie dishes. And um, yeah, apparently it's still served... Still prepared, I don't know if they eat it, um, <laughs> on Mothering Sunday in devices, yeah. Hmm. It um, has a little bit of history too. You know, it's mentioned in various places, so it's true, it did exist. There's a little piece in Thomas Hardy's novel, The Mayor of Casterbridge, where Michael Henchard got into a bit of trouble, spicing it all up with quite a bit of rum. <laughs> it frankly needed it, didn't it? Yes, it does. Um, Many references to it, and um, it's commenced in the 14th century. Um, Anyway, yeah, you know, we can give you the recipe if you're really interested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, You really don't want to go that way. No, I don't think so. (laughs) And anyway, that's that's, that's from a tea for you. Yep. Um, So a little bit more traditional are mince pies. Mm Mm-hmm. They were apparently also called shred pies. And <clears throat> come, you know, you see them in about the 16th century. But naturally, then, they contain real meat. Mm-hmm. Um, and they only got replaced subsequently with dried fruit and spices. And um, the shapes changed as well because apparently they're originally oblong. And generally referred to as coffins. Although I don't think that was because of the cholesterol or anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually the shape of them. Mm-hmm. Um, long, thin, which apparently commemorated the manger in ah, which the, the baby Jesus. baby Jesus was laid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then, Christmas puddings. Mm-hmm. A bit of a theme here. Originally, they did contain meat. Mm-hmm. And were known as plum potage. Potage, yes. Soup. Sort of. Well, yeah. Yes, I think it is these days, isn't it? Anyway, it was made of chopped beef or mutton and onions with dried fruit, breadcrumbs, wines, herbs and spices. And, um, yeah, the plum bit was actually the dried fruit, prunes or raisins. And it was quite runny. <laughs> but... They had a brainwave and replaced the meat with suet. <laughs> yeah. So for <laughs> we'll health get reasons. Rid of the meat. For we'll health put reasons, yeah. Fat in there instead. Nice bit of nice bit of suet. And um, the shape was made by obviously the cooking method, which they wrapped it in cloth. Yes. And then so that kind of became the norm. And um, boiled for many, many, many hours. And um, it's just been getting lighter and lighter. 
mm-hmm. and more and more sugary, I should think, mm-hmm. and less and less meaty. Mm. Did they the ever make? On. Did you ever have homemade Christmas puddings at your home oh, yes, as a child? Did. Yes, we did. Yeah, we had the whole boil in a cloth for hours and hours and hours. Steamy kitchen. Yeah, part of Christmas was water running down the walls. That was you it. Know. We did it once. Mm. With a shilling or two in. Oh, yes. And you were really, really, really chuffed if you got the shilling. Brian, you didn't break a tooth on it. Mm. Yes. Meant to be lucky, plus Meant also... <laughs> money. You got a bob. Yeah. Also yeah. a sixpence, actually. Mm. Yeah. I remember we did it once as a child and they hadn't got the lid on or something and it was only the next day they noticed that the ceiling was coated in a kind of <laughs> <laughs> greasy slime. <laughs> Ah, lovely. lovely. Yes. Thank you very much for those recipes, Janie. Now, as you know, on the Weird Tales radio show, we like to keep a bit of a uh, diary of the ritual year and folklore events. Uh, Janie's normally looking after that. But one of the other things that while we've been preparing that, we've been coming across various saints days, the more obscure saints days, not the better known ones. And um, today's saint, uh, this is the saint for the 21st of December, is St. Peter Canisius. And um, he was born at the beginning of the 16th century and he died. You'll be glad to know, unlike most of our saints who end up dying horribly and suffering as martyrs. He died in his bed at the age of 76 in the year 1597. However, his particular claim to fame is that in 1565, he actually became a secret agent for the Vatican. It was shortly after the Council of Trent and the Pope wanted to get a number of decrees of the Council to all the European bishops. Unfortunately, uh, that period of history, Europe was split between the Catholic countries and the uh, Reformation Protestant countries. And uh, clearly the Protestants were hostile to anything to do with the Catholics. And previous attempts to get these council decrees delivered had suffered failure. So, Peter Canisius was given the job. Uh, He was 43 years old at the time and he was a well-known Jesuit priest and had founded colleges that uh, even Protestants respected. So this gave him cover as as an official visitor for Jesuit foundations across Europe. However, Peter couldn't hide the decrees like our modern fictional spies in their microfilm messages in collar buttons or cans of shaving cream. Instead, he did the job travelling with a horse and cart and travelled across Europe with a large collection of these tridentine tomes, that's uh, the decrees of the Council of Trent. Each one was 250 pages long. And this is not to mention the fact he also had three sacks of books he took along for his own university. As I say despite the fact he was carting such a large pile of uh, inflammatory documents with him, he succeeded on his mission and returned safely and, as I said, died comfortably in his bed some uh, 30 years later. So, Peter Canisius, we salute you. Vatican spy extraordinaire. Something Wicked This Way Comes. Weird Harvest Press presents Harvest Hymns, the sweet fruits and twisted roots of folk horror. A two-volume set of books investigating the music of folk horror, featuring contributions from some of the biggest names in the field. Candia McCormack, Johnny Trunk, Maddie Pryor, Sharon Krause, Jim Jupp and Kemper Norton to name just a few. Available now via lulu.com. 100% of all weird Harvest Press profits are donated to wildlife charities. Welcome, fool. You have come of your own free will to the appointed place. 
It is time to keep your appointment with the Wicker Man. The Wicker Man. Well, today's show date is the 20th of December and uh, Janie will be talking about uh, some of the other events that are uh, associated with this part of December. However, I notice from my uh, flyer from the Fisher Theatre in Bungie that it's the opening night of their Christmas panto. We've discussed pantos before on this show. Uh, for those of you in America, it's a very confusing experience because the principal boy, the hero, is actually played by a woman, and quite obviously a woman. And at the end, she marries the heroine, who is played by a woman. All very good and clean and family wholesome entertainment. And the principal boy's mother, the dame, is played by a man, and quite clearly, obviously, a man as well. And I say, we regard this as good, wholesome, children-friendly entertainment. But about those pantos, what's always intrigued me are the origins of them. And uh, here's one that actually has a uh, relevance for uh, those of us who live in Norfolk. And indeed, uh, the tale is set uh, location about from 20 miles away from where we are located. So here we go. The Babes in the Wood. Uh, this is a uh, cheery tale about two young children left to die in a forest before being buried in a pile of leaves by Robin Breadbreast and his woodland friends. The first version of this story was circulated by a person called Thomas Millington of Norwich in 1595, and it had the not exactly snappily title of The Norfolk Gent, His Will and Testament, and How He Committed the Keeping of His Children to His Own Brother, Who Dealt Most Wickedly with Them, and How God Plagued Him for It. This is usually known as the Children in the Wood or the Norfolk Tragedy. It tells of two young children, the babes, a boy and a girl, who were left in the care of their uncle after their parents' premature death. The terms of the will were the family fortune would pass to the children unless they died before reaching adulthood, the age of majority, in which case the uncle would inherit the lot. I think you're with me here on what's going to happen next and you'll not be surprised to learn that Uncle was unwilling to leave this arrangement entirely to fate and hired a couple of thugs to ensure the children disappeared. The pretext was the children were being taken to London to be educated. However, the thugs, hired to deal with them, either abandoned the children without food and water in the depths of a forest, or else they quarrelled over the best way to dispose of the children, and while fighting among themselves, the two children fled into the forest and became irreparably lost. In due course, the children died of hunger and exposure, whereupon the birds covered them in leaves. Uh, this might seem a little bit of a prissy addition to the story, but by the standards of the 16th century, it was important for people to receive a proper burial rather than being just left to rot out in the open. Being a morality story, the story went on to uh, describe the divine retribution that befell the wicked uncle. These included his barns burning down, his crops failing, his cattle dying and his own children drowning on a sea journey to Portugal before the uncle himself was declared bankrupt and died in the debtor's prison. It's a grim story, but uh, Millington's tale continued to circulate over the next couple of centuries and was adapted for the stage in 1793. Then in 1827, it was adapted into the first version of a pantomime. However, curiously, for the first few years of it being performed as a panto, the story still retained its tragic ending, lightened only by the fact the spirits of the children were reunited with their parents in heaven. Oh, look, kiddies, we're going to take you to see a show where the two little kids die and their ghosts meet their parents in heaven. That's a happy ending. However, in 1867, the panto version was given a drastic rewrite and the second half of the show opening with the babes, 
traditionally called Dot and Trot, being rescued from their fate by none other than Robin Hood and his merry men, complete with Maid Marian, who became their godmother. This is broadly the version still performed today, with the wicked uncle sometimes depicted as the sheriff of Nottingham, and the whole show climaxing with the defeat of the uncle of, or the sheriff, and the children being restored to their rightful inheritance. So far so good, but where did Millington draw his original inspiration in 1595? The most likely suggestion is that it is based upon a true event which took place at Griston Hall near Watton, um, about 20 miles from Norwich, some 30 years earlier. A certain Thomas de Grey died leaving his home, Griston Hall, and its estates and all its revenues, to his seven-year-old son, Thomas Jr. Because he was so young, the boy was made a ward of court, and a marriage was arranged to another child, Elizabeth Drury. Such arrangements were not unusual in Elizabethan England, but were primarily to protect property interests and had nothing to do with romance, i.e. the kids didn't get a look in. It was an arranged marriage. However, it was also part of this will that should Thomas die, this is young Thomas, die before reaching majority adulthood, the inheritance would pass to his uncle, Robert de Grey. Four years later, the uncle sent Thomas away to visit his stepmother, that's his late father's second wife. But there, while en route, Thomas mysteriously died and Robert inherited the estate. Soon there were rumours Thomas had been murdered on the uncle's orders while travelling through the nearby Wayland Wood. Robert didn't help his cause by attempting to seize the dower funds, the money provided for a bride should the husband die before her, promised to Elizabeth Drury. The Drury family fought back, and for the rest of his life, Robert de Grey, that is the wicked uncle, faced legal problems. He was later fined and imprisoned in Norwich for a cussancy. This is failing to attend Anglican church services, which was uh, a bit of a thing in the uh, England in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, and is said to have died disgraced and bankrupt. In a further similarity to Millington's original tale, Robert's own sons never returned from a military expedition to Portugal. It's even suggested the story about the Robins burying the children may have been an allusion to a Robert robbing, see what they did there, his nephew, and covering up the evidence. Whatever the truth, this part of Norfolk is now firmly Babes in the Wood territory. There used to be an old oak tree in Wayland Wood, until it was destroyed by lightning in the late 19th century, was a tourist attraction because it was reputed to be where the babes sheltered on the night they died. I should just point out that there was only one babe, just young Thomas, who died. And you could even buy souvenir postcards of Griston Hall, which clearly identified the wicked uncle's house. And uh, even today, the village of Griston and the town of Watton feature the babes on their civic signs. Sadly, the spookiest legend that Wayland Wood derives its name from the Wailing Wood, because it is haunted by the ghostly sound of children sobbing, is without foundation. For as long as go as the Doomsday Book in 1086, these woodlands were called Wayne Lone, and that became Wailing Wood. So there, the true story of the babes in the wood. Here's Janie talking about what the 21st of December is, besides, of course, possibly being the Mad, winter, mad Shopping Day. Mad Shopping Day, apart from being a mad shopping day. <laughs> For people like moi and you, <laughs> <laughs> last minute items. Yeah, well, 21st of December is, as any fool knows, St Thomas's Day. Yeah, that's mm. St Thomas. And... Um, a widespread activity on that day, many, 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 many years ago, um, was Thomasing or Gooding. And basically it was a custom where poor women tramped around their neighbourhood and calling in at the various farms, houses of 
their wealthier neighbours with the expectation of receiving money, i.e. money being doled out to them, uh-huh. which might be where that mm. word the comes from. Comes. Yes. Yeah. Um, or food they might have. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it was... Um, it was considered that, you know, the farmers should and would give quantities of wheat or money, and it actually got called corning in some areas. That was like they were giving, giving corn. Giving corn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a quote, this is 1870s, that is recorded of cottage life in Hertfordshire. And uh, it goes that the women that I knew always called at the same houses and were evidently expected, for they told me they always got something at each place of call. One gentleman gave a new sixpence each year to every Thomaser at his home. I asked what they said or did when calling at the house. And they said, all he says is, please, we've come a Thomason. Remember St Thomas's Day. Give us the money. So, yeah, uh, it seemed to work. But, um, yeah, it was mostly confined to women, perhaps with the help of children, you know, because they were so poor. very poor. Uh, there wasn't, obviously, state help. Um, it did It did become called gooding, which was actually just another word for begging, which is... And it, it stems from as early as 1560, amazingly. Yeah, and well, it's not really, it really only worked in a quite small, close knit community where everybody knew each other and understood the rules. And um, things did change quite dramatically in the second half of the 19th century because local charities fell by the wayside or changed, and the givers started to sort of want a degree of control over what was given. And so they started. To, to group together and just pay into one charity and um, dole that out to needy people because obviously there was a tiny bit of abuse involved where um, those that could walk the furthest and get the greatest number of doles trudged around um, scooping up as much as they could uh, or splitting into various members of the family each going to the same house at different times of the day, <laughs> getting a bit of an unfair share. So they yeah. wised up to that eventually and, and put a stop to it. <laughs> Instead of giving to all comers, agreed to send their contributions of corn to the town hall, and then it was distributed under proper supervision to the deserving poor in proportion to the size of their families. Hmm. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, so ah. Thomas's day, Thomasing. Mm. Gooding. Mm. Mm. Begging, scrounging. We have some weird old traditions, don't we? We do indeed. Thank you very much for that. If you want to grow your business, save time using the latest tech and look great online, Weird Appeal Digital can help. We have a free, yes, that's free, download listing 40 digital tools, apps and resources to help you grow your brand, promote your project, generate leads and reach your audience just go to www.appeal.digital slash weird tales for smart effective digital design and your free download go to www.appeal.digital slash weird tales Well, that's it. We're almost done for today. Uh, thank you once again for joining us. It's uh, been our pleasure and we hope you'll join us again. But of course, it won't be till next year in uh, after the Christmas break. And uh, as by way of a final thought, if you don't want Santa to see you when you're sleeping, know when you're awake, know if you've been good or bad, and sell your data to third parties, then you should have checked your privacy settings. Take care, stay well, stay weird, stay different. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. 
You've been listening to The Weird Tales Radio Show with Charles Christian. Your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, magic, and folklore. Keep in touch with us online at www.urbanfantasist.com or by email at urbanfantasist.icloud.com or on Twitter at Christian Uncut. Good night. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales Radio Show.